Lord God, we thank you for your forgiveness. Today, it's all about that unexpected way that he brought us that forgiveness through your sights given to us so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Help us never to forget how unexpected and undeserved that gift is. And now help us to trust it as we walk the road of your forgiveness today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So last week we began this lesson. So we're going to be skipping the introduction, but we talked about the classic drive by are you that people like to ask and how these expected answers. But then because it seems we often fall into two areas. Either we're really happy with how we've been serving God in our lives and we think it's going pretty well. We're happy with what God's given us, maybe. Or we're on the other side and thinking, oh, I've really failed or God hasn't been good to me, whatever it is. But we're going to try to find the middle of that and those two dangers. A big key to this middle road of Christ's forgiveness is remembering that Jesus is the one that taught us to pray this in the Lord's Prayer. That's two truths that that tells us. One, that we need forgiveness. Everybody does. That's why Jesus tells us to pray this. And two, Jesus wouldn't ask us to pray for something he wasn't ready to give us. So one, we need it. And two, Jesus gives it. And that is, is that road we're going to walk. Because if you forget either side of that, you're in danger. And that's why it's described as a ditch, a dangerous ditch. And then we closed last week by looking at Jesus. Jesus. And the reason we looked at that is because I've known that since I've been a kid, many of you. Like, yeah, consider just how unexpected and amazing that truth is. That normally, you know, sheep are for the shepherd's livelihood and for his income and for all these things. And so, of course, he's not going to give up his own life for a sheep. But that's exactly what our good shepherd does. Even as we stray, he brings us back. Where you think of the parable of the 99, he goes and looks for the one. And this unexpected love of our shepherd that he willingly gives up his life for us it's not us we wrong god but it's not us who need to make it right god himself does so and this fits so well with the sunday today too as you'll go into worship at 10 30. so this is a phrase i want us to consider now the omnipotent god so the all-powerful god it's a good catechism word for you omnipotent pleads with the impotent sinner so the weak and not powerful sinner literally non-powerful sinner that is how god's word is and i meant to grab does anyone have a bulletin from today on them right now that's all right we could just discuss it while we think about it so this truth that god all powerful pleads with us even as we go running away from him who have no power to save ourselves this helps us walk that middle road and we see this every Sunday in our worship service. Okay, we have one. So the way our, our liturgy is set up is always communicating this truth. The powerful God leads with the weak sinner. What are some ways you see that in a, in a Lutheran service each week? Any thoughts? <clears throat> Feel free to just shout out to St. Clement Casey, or you can raise your hand. It's fine. I don't know. It's loose. <laughs> it depends on the liturgy we're using, but um, yeah, God has been merciful to us and has given us His only Son. Is there any other path we have? Solution? Yeah, absolutely. Every time, almost every week, you hear that He gave His only Son as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And then you get to hear that forgiveness personally given and applied to you. You're part of the world. We talked about that in lesson one. Awesome. What about at the very beginning of a Lutheran service? What is like the first thing we do after in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Yeah, confessing our sins. Right? Today we used a special gathering right for that that talks about how out of the depths we're crying to God. We're we're stuck down there by our own power. There's no way for us to get out. We're impotent sinners. But yet our God says, call on him. And so that's what we do in this opening line. And we say, we need your forgiveness. Is there anything else besides confession and absolution? I think 
that one's pretty pretty self-explanatory and that one's kind of an obvious one. Are there other things in the service that communicate this truth? Yeah, absolutely. Could you expand on that a little bit? What do you think? How does that communicate this truth? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, the creed outlines the way God saved us, right? There's such a, the second article is the longest in both creeds because it's outlining how Jesus' son came to save us. It had to be his power that came and then he, us, he's given us that faith to confess it. Okay, the creed. Anything else in the service? Absolutely. So you've got both sides. Yeah, his his almighty holiness and then what he what he set aside, the sacrifice himself. Yeah, the fact that he became one who is like an impotent one, not a sinner, of course. Christ was perfect, but he gave up his power for a time. And his, and uh, the evidence of his holiness, he put aside for a time to do that, to become our land. Any last thoughts of the service? I think every Sunday you hear in the sermon, law and gospel. You know, first the law that wounds you and reminds you that we need God. By ourselves, we have no power to save ourselves, to run, to even run from our sin. But then you hear that gospel that reminds you of how the all-powerful God was willing to save you, willingly give up his life for you. And then, of course, every week you leave the service hearing that blessing from God, that that all-powerful one is the one who gives you that blessing, that strength to go and live out your lives that week. Um, so watch for that. Those of you going to the late service, see how there's this communication in a service, most of all God to us, but us needing and recognizing that we need God completely because he's the powerful one. We are weak, he is strong, as Jesus loves me says. So take a look at that uh, that quote on your page. Number four. We're together this one, but first, this, this is what someone says to you. I know I'm in anything. I make little mistake, good person that looks out for others. God won't hold these slip-ups against me. What do you think? We're going to respond to you and use this passage bank. So we'll do four groups. Everybody's able to look at all the passages, but maybe uh, some, how about this side? You start backwards, work backwards in the passages, and this side, go from the beginning of the passages just to make sure we get to all of them. So this, you four right here will be a group, and then the five back here will be a group. And if you can, I think you're going to be joining us too, so you got to get a six. You know what, Steph, why don't you go up here there and get that balance out? The new three can work together. So respond to this person. And then the five back here, if you guys want to think about starting to that message, it's fun to let this person just say, Peter, good morning. Good to see you. Thanks for working that out for me by the way you're welcome good morning I'm <laughs> 
Two minutes, two minutes. When the fairy sees all this, one minute. Why doesn't he give you the time? I'm reading this. Jesus said, It is not the healthy way to God. No one will ever give this time. I am mercy, not sacrifice. For example, if all the right books, there is a great deal of people. It's all the best thing that we need. It's not. You're like, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. All right, fifteen seconds. Wrap up those thoughts. Maybe start designating someone that is going to be your. Your speaker, the person, this confident one. <laughs> All right. Did the groups have a reporter? All right. <laughs> All right, so let's bring it back. So I've got a random number generator here. This is group one. That's group two. Group three is in that corner, and group four is here. I'd like everyone to at least give one part in this conversation, and I'll play this guy that it, that is pretty confident, you know, uh, uh, in himself and and the things he's been. In. It sounds like he's stand up, gentlemen. But you'll be responding to him because now you've considered the scriptures. So let's see which group starts. Group three in that corner gets to start. So I've just got done saying what you saw on the page there. I mean, I'm a good person. I look out for others. So God won't hold up my little slip ups because I've kept those, those big things. What would you say? 
I tell you that the man, rather than the other, can be justified the one that he was just. Right? Is that what it says in the Bible? The first verse. Basically, I uh, beat myself, and that's what makes me right before God. Yeah. If you basically listen to the Bible, is if you even break it, you want to point for the wall, and you may not have heard what you may have hated to point in your life that is still not So, Hatred is equal to murder. Where do, who said that? That's ridiculous. Hatred is murder. James, <laughs> wow. Okay. Thank you. Who we'll put that there? All right. Let's see here. So that was group three. Thank you. All right. We'll continue the conversation. One, what do you think? All right, and uh, and Matthew was the next example. And I say, why, why you the sick that need doctors are the same way. Jesus came into the world to save the sinners. If we were all good people, he wouldn't need to come for us. Okay. So, <laughs> so basically, like I need to be a sinner for Jesus to to save me. So I got to go and do more of that. You're a sinner by default. By de wow, you'd really say that about me? I would. Goodness. <laughs> this group's pretty rude. I but I all these things I've done. Wow. Well, let's see if group two can can help me understand. Right now I'm kind of sick trying to talk about it. So what do you think? That's right. Yep. Said that, you know, nobody's truly righteous you know, everyone wants to deal with that uh that was perfect. And that was the you know. That something wrong with you, you just know that it's like it's like forgiveness. You appreciate the gospel. Yeah, I, I know. I know he forgives those little slip ups. I mean, I know that, but you know, I just can't. You know, God tells us so much about how to live and all that. And I feel like I've been doing my best, and doesn't he appreciate that at all? He does appreciate it. You know, God sees what you're doing, and He loves you very dearly. But you know, you do, but you're not perfect all the time. And even then, you know, God's going to forget about it. But he will, but eventually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> feel free to start trying to get forth and what, but so what's the point of the law then? I mean, God gives us all these things we're supposed to do, right? I mean, a lot of the scriptures is like that. Jesus' sermon on the mount. I was just reading that. He, yeah. say, he says all these things we got to do. You know what? You're right. I think Jesus did say hatred is murder in that. So now I'm realizing, yeah, even James too. Okay. But but why would he tell us all these ways to live if I wasn't supposed to try to do that to be right with God? You guys have any thoughts on that? Or group three of you still? But... We want to try to live our lives in thankfulness to God. Our motivation is out of thankfulness for the love that he has shown us and forgiveness he's given us. Not because we have to do it to attain salvation. Mm -hmm. And and a lot there is conscious. I the answer is always because I want you. <laughs> Very good. Very good. <laughs> yeah. So because God loves me, his scripture tells me I'm I'm a sinner and need his forgiveness. Yeah. And then you can like kind of sit with Jesus right away. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for playing along with that. Sorry, good for you. Unless you have anything else you want to say to this guy before he goes, uh, I'm walking away. <laughs> According to the law, even with the stakes, you're still a sinner. Yeah. Still yeah. So no man, no matter what you do, you do. There's just nothing you can do to save yourself. Mm -hmm. It works. Um, only through the grace of God and faith. And understanding, you know, Jesus died for our sins. You're safe. Yeah. And I think Romans 3 23 should have been added. <laughs> You're on to something. I was going to say, now look a little further at Romans. So, but thank you, Greg, which we will do. Yeah. All of sin. And then how does that guys in that? But then all are justified freely through Christ Jesus. Thank you for playing along with me. I think you, 
you'd think you don't run into people like that, maybe because of the circles we've been blessed to learn about God in and things. But pastor and those who have gone on visits know that we run into this all the time. It's so much about, you know, becoming good before God. And then you wonder if you've ever been good enough. So I think it's important to practice how you can answer people like that. Because you also have to be aware that people are going to put their walls up really quickly. Like I tried to act for you, which is hard to do. But, you no, know, they're going to say, you know, that how dare you call me a sinner? How dare you say God is disappointed in me when I've been putting in so much work and doing my very best for him? Like, I love God. And you're going to tell me that he hates me because of my sin? He hates my sin? But... But he also loves me. He hates, he hates the sinner I've become, but he loves me, loves me so much at the same time that my sin saves me. Loves me, the sinner that he recognized by Jesus came. But they still think there's maybe something they've got to do. And so maybe we don't want to instantly hit them with a James 2. As we work our way into it, but then I think once we, yeah, I mean, when I look at that, I recognize that really humbles me because I might think I'm really good, but I read that passage and I realize, wow, even if I stumble once, I'm guilty of breaking everything. And so, yeah, Romans 3.23, and just even a little further in Romans, we saw that that's the whole purpose of the law. That's so important. Not the whole purpose, but one of the main purposes of the law is that we become conscious of our sin. We recognize our need for God. God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. And so this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So a righteousness apart from the law. Because Romans has just revealed to us that the law shows us we need something outside of ourselves. So this person we just responded to is an example of someone in this ditch, the ditch of carnal security. They're relying on themselves and how good they've been to be right before God. With those people, we want to gently show them, no, God's word says that Jesus requires perfection. We could have put that one in there, Matthew 5, 48. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. The Bible tells us if we stumble once, we're guilty of breaking it all. The Bible tells us that the law exists to show us that we are sinners. Every mouth is silent. No one who's, who does good, not even one. What's that? God doesn't waste sins. It's mm -hmm. all the same. Important. That's right. Mm -hmm. We may think that for good men are selfless, but to God, it's all the same. It's all sin. Absolutely. Pastor? We can keep the big picture in mind that because God wants something better for us than a life that's contaminated by big single sin. I mean, the, the little thing one else knows about, they still cause plenty of problems. Um, and, and he wants something better than that. So he is serious about all sin. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Um, yeah, we'll see. Pay attention in worship, and we'll see an unlikely way that God did do that. It's not even just through the law, but he uses other things in our lives to pull us back and recognize our need for him. All right, so let's move on to a very familiar par parable. Um, it's the parable of the two sons. So I don't think we need to read the whole thing, but just head to Luke 15, and we'll take a look at it together. Just to remind us some of the these details that we see there. Or carnal secure. All right. See, so you remember that first son in the parable? His son goes to his father and asks, Give me my share of the inheritance. So he runs off, squanders it in wild living. Um, and he's at the brink of destruction, whatever, feeding the pigs, which would have been disgusting animals to Jews, unclean. And he longs to eat what he's giving to the pigs. So he's hit rock bottom, um, but he comes back, of course, and finds his father's open arms, as this artist has shown from one of the kids' Christ-like books, um, oh, arms open for his son, welcoming him back, such unexpected love from the father. 
But then we run into this other character, this, this second son, who is outside doing his work, and he hears all this commotion. And I'll, I'll read some parts of that. We'll start there at verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. The brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slave." Saving for you and never disobeyed orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive for that parable. Take just a minute to talk to your group. Talk about how each son showed, at least, or at least at one point in the story, the danger of carnal security. So confidence in themselves, overconfidence in themselves and their own flesh. Um, take one minute to discuss how you can see it in each son. I think this is also the similar to the the of the workers in the field when they were paid the same wages. He's getting aided as father's generous. Yeah. People who have followed up and paid for that converted with any more honesty that is knowledgeable in the Bible. That we when we hmm. people that they don't go to see what's saying that people are doing salvation, yeah, we shouldn't be mad that we do. We live in better expectation of our life. Kind of like good morning. All right. How about the first son? Uh, how did you see our security with him? Yeah. This parable isn't necessarily Jesus specifically talking about a, a narrow road of forgiveness here, but we can certainly apply this um, as Jesus is teaching us about his kingdom. And, you know, he's given everything to his sons, to, to his children. Uh, but yeah, this one took advantage of that and thought he could do whatever he wanted, could make it on his own, and he found himself at rock bottom. Any other thoughts on the first son? The first son gave in to earthly pleasures, and you can also say idolatry, mm -hmm. is going out of godliness and into worldliness. Yeah. And he, you know, he went as far away as possible from, from some God's grace or from the mm -hmm. Father. There's an arrow there. Um, but you, as I'm sure, he, 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 he wants to, you know, to, um, to recognize the evil we've done. And if you do, there is that acceptance back. Yes. Mm -hmm. We're all Absolutely. Doing it. Some of us are to be more clear than others. <laughs> there is a chance for. Were you listening to that last section? I said it's accepted. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's. Uh, Thank you.
you're, you're reminding us a little bit of the ditch that part of this kernel security, right? So this first kind of thinks it doesn't matter what I do. Uh, you know, now that I've got all this good blessing, and sometimes we might be tempted to say, yeah, I've got forgiveness. It doesn't matter what I do now, but there's such great danger in that. Um, yeah. We said the person also, he said, I'm going to go back to my father and, and maybe he'll let me be a servant. So he, he was not properly understanding the love and forgiveness of his father either. Mm -hmm. You swerve out of one ditch, it's like you're out of control and you head toward the other one. So this guy was so on the heights of carnal security thinking he had it all figured out. Everything was going to be great. He hits rock bottom so fast that now he doesn't even think his own father could ever forgive him and that he'd be lucky to maybe even just be received as a servant. And so you see how quickly it's, that's why we got to talk about a narrow road here that if we convict someone of their sin, like we were doing before in the last activity, that was kind of the goal. If we leave them there and don't ever take them further down Romans 3 or to the gospel, we could be helping them swerve right into the ditch of despair. Uh, so it's always that narrow road between. So thank you, Nancy, for bringing that up. All right, the second son. How is he an example of carnal security? Matthew? I guess I... For people who go to and live in a church setting like us, more time, mm -hmm. I feel like compare us to the second son in that we... We feel like we're better than any people, and we get mad that our father is generous and that he's giving the same salvation to anyone who comes to him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you get almost envious or jealous of the salvation we have. I mean, we don't want to, well, but that awful person, are they welcome here? And so are you say, are you answering that second part of the question too then? So, you know, which son is more like us? You'd say the second one. Is that what most of you felt, that the second son is more our danger? Maybe right now, as people who are sitting in a Bible study and about to go to church or have gone to church on a Sunday morning, right? That doesn't mean we shouldn't watch out for the ditches of the first son. But yeah, I think that that second son starts to think or starts to forget why they are who they are, why they're sitting here where they're sitting. It's all because of the grace of God. We start to think that it's our own doing and start to grow confident in that. And then suddenly when someone who hasn't grown up in that or hasn't experienced that grace so much comes to visit and we maybe scoff at them, the thing they don't know. Um, or maybe it's a different livelihood that they had and we think that's just so revolting. How could they come to this church? Um, and there are many other things. Didn't we have a Bible study recently about the connection? Yeah. So the, the second set is being that critical, but he's forgetting the most aspect of that. Right? Yeah. 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 That part that says, you know, there's things that can be deep. Right? Yeah, exactly. He's thinking, yeah, really, they're thinking the same thing. The, the first son thinks there's no way his father will accept him because he hasn't done anything that deserves accepting. The second son thinks, I've done a lot of things that deserve accepting and deserve a party. Both of them were, were working in a works righteousness kind of mindset. The other said, I've done all this. Don't I deserve more? When I just love the way that Jesus has that father respond. Everything I have is yours. We run into this danger of the second son when every Sunday we come to church and we hear those truths, those amazing truths that we cannot take for granted, but we're always tempted to say, well, I've heard that all before. I know. I know. What am I going to do after church now? You know, that's the second son kind of mindset that forgets the amazing things we already possess. I'm going to keep us moving just so we can get to the ditch of despair. Uh, before this so yeah so uh let's yeah let's swerve let's swerve to despair um you guys probably know that we, we don't have to do the merc unmerciful servant but remember that was that there was that servant that was forgiven this massive massive debt that would have been billions of dollars in today's money in this parable and then he goes and beats up this other servant who owed him yeah, a decent amount but nothing in comparison to what he'd just been forgiven 
And it's really what we should have talked about. He'd forgotten the amazing forgiveness he'd already received. And he wasn't willing to give it to others. Um, and when we're, so let's discuss why that is. So this, this uh, study is based on a book called The Narrow Lutheran Middle by Professor Deutschland, or it's the inspiration for this study. He had this quote. He said, sometimes the most unforgiving can be those who have been forgiven the most. And I think the parable of the unmerciful servant proves that, or at least Jesus shows that that can be the case. So take one minute to discuss why, why you think that is. Why would people who have personally received a lot of forgiveness be tempted to be able to? One minute, go ahead. It's actually the best guess to be there at school as opposed to taking gain secondly. All right, it's just about time. Finish those thoughts. And Peter, if you'd like to chime in on any of these, just announce to me. It's just a little hard to hear this morning. I hear. Let me know. Thank you. I'm doing fine. All right, awesome. Thanks. Appreciate it. Sorry, I don't come back to the Zoom as much as I should. All right. <laughs> Why are those who are forgiven the most sometimes the least forgiven? Pride. Pride. Explain that. So they're forgiven. How does pride creep into that? They just feel like now they're better than other people. Mm -hmm. So they're more judgmental. Well, yeah, for the most we can get when when we owe debts, when we have something to uh responsibilities to do, we push them away. But when things are supposed to be given to us, we seek them out as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we think to the extent that first servant went to get his forgiveness, begging at the knees of the king. Sorry, we cut you off there. I was just thinking that. I mean, we come to church and we said sometimes we think, oh, well, we're better than the right. person who not to the church. And so the ones who are living a simple life and mm -hmm. all of us have been forgiven for a lot. Yeah. Greg reminds us that all of us have been forgiven for a lot. We start, you know, we're, we're, we're we, might be tempted to think we're the ones that come credit this. Yes. Yeah, you talked about how you're looking at yourself rather than the gift of forgiveness you've been given. And so you start thinking, well, I finally turned around me and I'm doing the right thing now and kind of looking down and being harder on the mm -hmm. people who have done that. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Helen? Thank you. 
And then God, being able to get more money. Yeah. For, you know, other people. Yeah, that's profound because we think about how this is illustrating forgiveness. And you start to think, well, I've got that big forgiveness. So now I can do these little things and it'll be okay. You know, and I can get away with that. Or maybe he gets a big head really quickly because he thinks, well, that's because I did such a great job begging that king. Wow, I had a great pity speech. That got me my forgiveness. And that starts to get you big head. All sorts of different things. So thank you for your thoughts. I don't think there's any specific one reason. I think this first answer, it ultimately comes back to So the danger of this ditch ultimately leads us back to this. It tries to convince us that the impossible is possible. Us gaining salvation for ourselves by our own work. But then that reminds us of when a rich man came to Jesus so convinced, like that guy we, we responded to, that he had done enough, that he kept the commandments since he was a boy. And Jesus says that, I tell you, it's harder for a camel, the largest animal they would have known, to go through the smallest eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And his disciples picked up on that and they knew what he meant. That then who can be saved? But that's when Jesus says, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And so when we are hit with that uh, temptation to think we're good enough and then we get pulled back down to reality, can do nothing to earn salvation, we're we could be pulled back to this ditch, the ditch of despair. So now we're going to take a look at that. So this side of the group. This side of the room. And this side of the room, go to Luke 20. Actually, this one we'll just do on our own. Just yes, do. See the question there? What brought Peter to this ditch of despair in all of these situations? So take a look at the context around it and see why is he despairing like he is. And sorry, Thank <laughs> All right. I think maybe those contexts were somewhat familiar. If you didn't get to it, we're just going to keep pumping forward. So here, I put the verses up here so the two sides you can see. So the first one, we have Simon Peter falling before Jesus saying, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. That's a pretty despairing phrase that he just said to Jesus. What led him to this point? This side of the room. Oh, sorry. This side. I forgot I did it backwards. <laughs> This side of the room. Why is he saying something like this? Is that the first time he realized that he was not? It, it, it kind of almost seems like it, or at least fully comprehended it, right? Yeah. yeah. So it was the miraculous catch of fish, you know, where they can't even get it into the boats and all of these things. And Peter just falls before him and says this. So why do you think he's saying that once he realizes this is God? He didn't have the right to be before this God. Yeah. I mean, if he knew all the Jewish scriptures that he would have been going to temple hearing and he heard about how serious God takes sin, and this is God standing before him, he falls down and says, I, I don't, I can't have you near me. Go away from me, Lord. I'm a simple man. And ultimately, at the, at the depths of despair, the ditch of despair, this is what we're saying, too. We don't think God could possibly want to be in our presence or could forgive us. Go away from me. 
I'm a sinful man. All right, so now in Luke 22, 62, we find him weeping bitterly outside. What led him to this ditch of despair? Matthew. Well, was denying Jesus, but what led him to that was ultimately his own pride and confidence in himself. If he decided he would do something, and he went against his omniscience and all-knowing, and he said, that's not true, I would never deny you. And then when he does, he realizes what he did wrong. Yeah, I think some of you were here on our Wednesday when we considered pride during Lent. And we, we looked at this part, so the, the Peter's denial. And you, you hit it head on, Matthew. He was so confident in himself that he couldn't have seen himself falling. So then when he did, <laughs> he hit rock bottom really fast. And we were talking about that once, say how so often despair is self-despair. We think of ourselves so highly before we fall into a sin. We're so confident we left that pet sin in the dust. Then when we fall into it yet again, we think, wow, God must just be so disappointed in me. I've already had to ask for forgiveness for this so many times. I've promised him so many times I'd be better. And then I wasn't. But then we start to see the, the comfort that Jesus gives to us in those moments. Just a couple of verses later, Peter or Jesus says to Peter, don't be afraid, right? It's okay that you're in my presence because the reason I'm here in the flesh was to come and save you, Peter. Obviously, he doesn't say that then, but he slowly reveals that to Peter and all of us. <laughs> if we are in danger of this ditch of despair, then we read what Jesus or what God tells us. In First John one nine, he is faithful and just, and will forgive, will forgive us our sins. It's always there. Confess our sins to Him, no matter how many. Even when we fall again, we can go running back to Him. But then, if we're thinking like Peter did before his fall, where he was a little more on the carnal security side, then we read First Corinthians ten twelve. If you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. As soon as you start to have all this confidence in yourself not going to fall you've left that sin behind well then that over it let's see do we have the time for this i don't want to end with this so we'll, we'll work i think we can do it let's work through it quickly matthew 27 just to look at where this ditch of despair risks an end that is a ditch. Mm -hmm. I'll read this for us, so if you can't get there, I'll read it nice and loud, too. Matthew 27. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans. How to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. So, what can we learn from Judas's ultimate end about the ditch of despair? He didn't realize Christ was his. Yeah. <clears throat> Ultimately, when you betray the Savior, that, that remorse must have just, you can't, I mean, it says that how remorse shaped, shook him, seized with remorse. Um, when you start to, he had that mindset of Peter at his knees, he had that mindset of Peter going out and weeping bitterly. The problem was he never came back to Jesus or recognized that Jesus' forgiveness would have been there for him. And if we deny his forgiveness and say, that's not for me, then we're not believing in Christ and what he came to do for us. Thanks be to God that this morning you are spoke those 
where it's like holy and merciful for holy and gracious God, I confess that I am knew that you could confess your sins and hear his forgiveness. Thanks be to God for those of you who are about to do that in the service this morning. Receive his body and blood for forgiveness. Because we recognize that there are people in this point, and we have to go and let them know that God still loves them. That in confessing their sins to him, he will forgive them before they meet an end in their despair. Yeah, I think one thing mm -hmm. about this that I know the chief priests obviously weren't believers because they were trying to kill Jesus, but at the same time, this is an example of when they could have shown compassion or we as believers, we know someone has done something awful and we have the opportunity, are we going to say, yeah. that was horrible and I can't even talk to you? Yeah. Or, you know, someone, if someone at that point had been able to talk to you. Yeah, nobody wanted to talk offer yeah i've been thinking so this could be a wonderful discussion to have we could go on discussing this for ages um perhaps having a study on something like suicide you know to just discuss that and like you're right as a believer to go and help obviously this isn't the only cause for something like that but i think often it is um a despair of the grace of god that god couldn't love me um yeah yeah, he just got no sympathy. You know, the, what is that to us? What is that to us? Um, yeah. So, <laughs> you have to be careful what solutions you give, though. Some this. People in the ditch of despair long there or without deep need for longing in the ditch of despair? No. How would you tweak this? We are, we do have failures every day, mm -hmm. all day. <laughs> but because of Jesus' this love, um, we are forgiven. Mm -hmm. Or a new person every day. Yeah. This is something to be so careful of. Because this sounds good, doesn't it? And this is what people so naturally want. When we're in despair, and, we're, and think about the moments when you've been in despair over your own sin. We've all been there. And you long for that day when you can just leave it in the dust. You long for that day when you can be better than that sin and overcome that sin. But that mindset's dangerous because now instead of relying on the grace of God and the strength of God, you're waiting for the day when you can have carnal security, when you can go diving into the other ditch. Instead of longing for Christ's forgiveness, which is like Becca said, a recognition that no, we do have failures. But it's Christ who makes us whole. That's the narrow road. But instead, so many are looking to just do a dive right over that narrow road into the other ditch where they can just be confident in themselves. Um, so we have to help people realize that. And that's part of what's driving them to despair in the first place. is because they're really struggling to feel that they're without failure. Well, that's their conscience is telling them that, yeah, they are without failure. We need Jesus. But they, you see today so much. Mm -hmm. Instead of telling people, people are told, no, your sins are okay. So you're giving into that. You're telling them, no, there's nothing wrong with you. All your sins are, you're okay. Mm -hmm. Instead of, no, it's still sin. Yeah. But God forgives you and let's try to mm -hmm. live a God pleasing way. Yeah. yeah, so much of uh, advice that the world wants to give is no, no, you are strong. You are good enough to beat this. I have confidence in you. And that's, that's good to encourage someone in that way. But when it comes to getting rid of all our failures and our sins, no, we're, we're not. Remember that passage we just looked at. For man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And this really illustrates this proverb, doesn't it? There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. A very literal translation of this is there's a way that appears to be right to a man, but in the end, leads to death. So often we try to... <laughs> either win God's forgiveness, win his favor by our actions, or in despair, we think we've got to make it right, we've got to be better. 
But the way that's right to God is just leaning on him and him alone. So ultimately, both of these ditches, it's where our eyes are. That are the one. Both ditches have ourselves. In despair, it says, looking at ourselves, in Christ's security, it's saying, I'm good enough for God. I've done enough. Our eyes need to be on the cross of Christ. Recognize that he had to die when we're, when we're feeling overconfident in our own flesh, and then recognizing that he did die when we're despairing of our sin. Um, next week, to wrap up, we'll look at 1 Corinthians 15. To see how uh, all helps walk that middle road. But for now, uh, uh, so let's uh, let's close with just looking at that last verse on your back page. As we walk this life, it, it can be stressful trying to walk the narrow road. Scripture. We constantly have these things pulling us away, but that's when we should just come back and just bask in the glory of what Jesus says to us in Matthew 11. It says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then remember what a yoke is. It brings two locks together so that the work is done together. And it's not that there is work. It's not that it isn't difficult to be reminded of his forgiveness or reminded of his seriousness of sin, whatever we need in that moment. But he's right there with us in this journey because he's helping us hold it up. His yoke is easy. And the burden is light. And so it says to us, so let's go worship and, and hear all about that. Let's, oh, sorry, we should, pray. we should pray. Lord God, thank you so much. I just thank you that such an amazing blessing is right here in this room. There are all these Christians gathered who know your forgiveness, who believe in you and your son. That is an incredible miracle, Lord, and we ask you to never let us take that for granted. I pray that all those in here who are despairing of their sin found confidence today that you forgive them. And when I ask you to humble all of us who may think that it's because of us that you've saved us, but rather only by your grace. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.